Nine fire engines couldn't put it out. Oh my lord. Before we continue with Andy, just wanted to mention three things. We're a small startup. We love making these tools and resources for the music making community, much of which we provide for free. All we ask in return is you subscribe to our channels. It makes a big difference to a company of our size. Secondly, another way you can support us is we've got some really cool merch now online, including some awesome black sheet posters and t-shirts, many more designs than you can see here. So be first in line to get your hands on some of this hot swag. And as an example of resources and tools that we provide, there's a link down below to the full uncut warts and all version of this session we did with Andy. Right, on with Andy. There's a bit of a story to tell, but we'll get to that in yes, a minute, Andy. Because the last time I visited you, Isle of Wight, yes. I believe you moved here about six and a half years ago. Yeah, with all of that lovely vintage kit. Yes. And I'm now looking at a lot of not vintage kits. No. Lovely kits. Yes. I've seen something over there that I highly disapprove of, but yeah. we'll also come to that as well. Yes. So, do you yeah, want to yeah. just kind of walk us around? Yeah. What's the thinking behind the, the space? Okay, so the main thinking behind the space for the first time, because this is absolutely from scratch, is this kind of everything that I use around me. So this, I can just scoot around this chair, everything plays, everything's on. That's the main thing, to stop me sitting at that keyboard constantly. Yeah. That's my thing. So you know, you can see all the faders, you can see the iPads, we get into that. I don't want to have my, ha my hand on the mouse all the time, look at the screen all the time. So this main area is the creative space, but I play all of this stuff and it all comes up straight away. Then the next thing was kind of guitar corner. I'm not a guitarist, but I play a bit and I like to make the kind of, the noise you get on a string you can't do on a synth, yeah. as simple as that. So, that's kind of, I would sit there with a like Zoom recorder just going, noodling around and then sample the hell out of that. So you have a Zoom recorder that's just rolling? Yeah, and I think it's something like this. I mean, I do sometimes have the, have the door rolling, but um, this thing here, whatever, H4, H6, whatever it is, yeah. I'd usually stick that in front of the speaker as well because something about that mic just sounds a bit weird and I'm sampling and chopping. So I do really, really like that. And I use this a lot. I even put it over by the piano. And it also, if you forget to hit record, this thing's always recording. So I usually and sit there. It, sometimes it's just that, it's that sound. Yeah, and it could be I left it going for two hours once and I went over and it went, wow, what the, f you know, yeah, yeah, the Zoom recorder's still going. Certainly in the last couple of years, a lot of experimenting has been with microphones rather than mic amps now. Okay. So, you know, we're, we're going to talk about my disaster in a bit and my mic camps <laughs> went, but I didn't lose any mics and I've discovered that super, super high quality uh, RME mic amp, 12 mic amp, unbelievable. And it brings these old mics to life. So I've been with eBay 22 years and... <laughs> I've been I, with eBay? 22 I've been a partner years. of eBay. 22 years, right? <laughs> I had something stolen off of eBay, through eBay, so they keep saying thank you for being with us, 22 years. So I bought that about 23 years ago, before eBay was in the UK, for not a lot of money. It's a Sony, um, let's have a quick look. So Sony C C37A, that one, and it is Minter, uh, you know, I like mint stuff. And then you go And these are going for about eight grand now, aren't they? Yeah, you'd, yeah, you'd pay more than eight grand for that one because everything's original, cables, oh, uh, valve, wow. everything. That's never been opened. You've got some lovely mics over here as well. Yeah, so the last time you were in the studio, all of these I still had, but the old studio on the Isle of Wight was quite damp. Yes. So the only reason these things all survived, they're all original. I mean, even this thing, this looks brand new. This is, this is absolutely original. This is our wow. RCA44. This, this is as it come. They're all like minters and they all do their own job. Ball and biscuit, two different types. This is really good fun. If you want that, n like this is a sort of um, directional spy mic if you want, but basically yeah. they call it the hairdryer mic in the States and you can get a really weird notch filter without using a filter. Gotcha. Now the room itself has got a lovely live character to it. Yeah. Is that, that by design? Yeah, so if you look up there, so I haven't, they haven't quite finished. I've got a couple more of these sale things coming. 
Um, but when we're in the little kind of circle there, you'll find it's circle the noises. Of fire. Circle of creation. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> but the key is for me, um, similar to the Isle of Wight, better in here because of the shape, is I don't want a dead room. It's hideous. Yeah. It's absolutely hideous. No one listens to shit in a dead room. You see, I've been, I've been eyeing this up. Yeah, so this thing can be a bit odd in the way it works, in a bit like an organ. Um, and it just comes up with mad sounds. I think this is the front panel, so. Really? Korg are doing something right at the moment, aren't they? Well, exactly. And this, this was not expensive and it will work for probably forever. And if you bought an old one, it would be all crusty and geek gang. Yeah. And exactly the same for that. So that's my first FS. Both filters. And I can tell you, the original ARP is so close to that. And if anything, this, for modern music, this is that punchy edge again. The expander, which I had before, I just, I loved those things. Um, I'm really not familiar with these at all. Well, the expander is the original modular and it's really easy to work. So see f filter frequency, whatever, you just mm. touch that and then decide where you want it, envelope one and a percent. And mm. then you go envelope level two and a percent. Mm -hmm. So you can modulate anything from anything similar to a Moog One. Okay. It's not as easy as a Moog One, but basically, but it has that sound. It has that kind of um, very tr Frank Goes to hollywood -y stuff. Very good at those tips. But yeah, it's a, just a great synth. The first synth made with no keyboard. Wow. So it's pretty cool. This is two RM, I think they're called RME Moogs, the very first Moogs. Mm -hmm. re the original boards re-put into this thing. And everything else here is original modular. The modular is about 100 grand. So these are like the holy grail. So these are the most famous filters of any synthesizer ever made. This is the original uh, modular Moog filters. High and low pass. Got a plaque from here. You can hear the tunings out up there, right? Can you yeah. hear the tracking? So the tracking's only out good for an octave. I've changed my door and I was struggling with UAD. We'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> so I was struggling with UAD and I come across a thing called RME. Yeah. So I have an RME box called an RME to Maddie. It's a little tiny thing. This RME has 12 channels of mic. The first four can be high impedance. You can plug a guitar in. These first four are TRS as well. Um, that then goes into the Farafish and then the Farafish sends that down the light pipe. The other game changer of RME is this, which is so even though RME is straight in and out, it does also have the mixer. So you don't need your door running to hear anything. OK, Andy, you sent me a photograph that was deeply traumatising a couple of years ago. What happened? Well, there was a, this building is connected to a stable next door. And in the corner of the stable, there was a, uh, like a conduit where the, you know, where the horses were and some power. And we think, well, there was an investigation for three or four days. Basically, one of those little cables caught fire about seven o'clock at night. Um, a friend of mine called from the end of the village. I ran out with my son and we saw smoke, called the fire engine. They were here in about eight minutes, nine minutes, the first fire engine. It was a horrendous night. It went from hail to sideways snow to it was windy as hell. Nine fire engines couldn't put it out. First of all, it took the stables out. It went that way, but we got a pond. And this was safe, and then suddenly it come back, and it went over the roof where your your side. It went over the top, and then just started destroying it. And, and for those who haven't seen it, you you had one of the most amazing collection of yeah, I of, did of like real one-offs. My expander that I had, I got it off Tom Oberheim. I phoned Tom Oberheim and bought it because it was bought in the eighties, you know, yeah. in the early nineties. And the VCS three was made for me by Robin Wood, the guy who invented. You know, so whatever happens, you don't want to fire because dealing with a fire psychologically. It's really, really difficult. It is difficult. And I still look out the window and just make sure it's not on fire. Really? All my fire detectors are Google, which now beat me straight away. Like, uh, you know, and well, it's, it's just terrifying, is it? It's absolutely, you just can't believe it. It's how helpless you are. I just stood and watched it all burn and everything burnt. I've got a furniture thing. I do furniture design as well. That all went. So that both businesses gone in one go. It was just horrifying and you just got to take stock, you know, and, and it took about nine months to get my head around it. We were properly insured, but when I started researching the value of my synthesizers, Jesus Christ, some of the synthesizers were worth a fortune that I didn't know. So mm -hmm. I hadn't bought a synthesizer for 10 years. And do you think psychologically, 
uh, moving on as opposed to trying to get back to where you were is yes I, I mean I made a conscious effort everyone said are you gonna get this 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 um, and I said to everybody I'm not gonna buy it. there was a hand it was three things I believe that I bought when well, I bought the ARP uh, an expander I can't live without an expander ARP an expander and I made a modular 100m those three things I like the sound of everything else is new the fire brigade were here this wind had blown out and the, they were leaving at about 10. So they, they arrived at seven in the evening and they left at 10 a.m. the next day, nine fire engines. And I said to them, I could see this roof, this corner, didn't, the slates were on. And I said, is there anything survived up there, mate? You know, the, no, 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 it's all gone. And don't go up there, it's, um, it's condemned. And before they went off the drive, my wife knew I had a ladder, me and my son, and I went straight in and we threw all the cases out, passed stuff down, cracked them open with like crowbars and all the mics survived inside the cases. And the linings of the cases are original, so there's no... And the weak. heat didn't... No, the heat melted them. Again, Planet of the Apes style, but we cracked them open, and the heat didn't damage the hard drives at all. But what boxes or cases were the mics in? They were in these waterproof Pelly cases, like a camera guy would use. Um, and, as I say, the cases were ruined. And, oddly enough, after all this stuff was happening, I phoned Pelly to replace the cases, and well, maybe they don't want me to say on the video, but it's, it's a lifetime warranty. They sent me all the cases for free. It's like two, two and a half, three thousand pounds of cases. That's what made them survive. But now, you know, I'm not thinking of fire, so my mics are out and I look at them every day. I've, I haven't ever looked at my mics because they're in these waterproof cases all the time. So, Andy, before we get back into the fun, lessons learned and recommendations to people about, I mean, these things, it happens. One is have your insurance, if you're worried at all, get your insurance to do a survey. So there is a little twist to this, that in the September, sort of six months, five months before my fire, um, they saw what was going on with the studio and that eventually after four years, and they said, we're not going to insure you with your lifestyle policy. You need to take a commercial policy for your furniture design and a commercial for your studio, and your home is domestic, the building's domestic. And I roughed my feathers because it doubled my cost, but I did accept it. So four months before the fire, I'd been evaluated, up to date. You couldn't be more up to date. So the main thing is, is to make sure you're insured. I had a record of everything I had, and if your synthesizer's worth 10 grand and you bought it for 500 pounds, you need to insure it for 10 grand. If you're underinsured by, say, 50%, then you get 50%. That's that. So if you claim for 100,000, you'll get 50. You're not allowed to be underinsured. Were you thinking about the synths when the place was on fire? No. No? No. No. Just could just no because none of us thought it was going to be big fire, be a big fire. Believe mm. it or not, it's just kit. I love it. Yeah, but it's just kit. No family in here. No family in here. No animals. No pets. No nothing. I have every single file since the hard drive was invented. Still, right from Akai right the way through. Um, so that was lovely. That was lovely. So um, halfway through the last project, No Way Up, which is coming out shortly, um, I was running into problems. I was a Logic user, as you know. Uh, I know you are as well, and I still am. I like Logic. But um, I just having these random crashes. What I discovered was that the new Macs with the big memory and the, and the um, just, it was the first version of their silicon. Um, for the demos, I did the five reels in one project. So you know, you've got, obviously, everything starts on one hour, two hours, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. So you've got, like, a six-hour timeline. Mm -hmm. Well, first thing I noticed was Logic zooms and it on a six-hour timeline. And if you turn off the grid, then it doesn't. Right. So you know you have that little grid on Logic that you can just see, like, a fine line? With that in, your zooms were glitching on a six-hour timeline with 900 tracks. You were doing the entire project in one Logic file? In one Logic file, not to finish, but because on this project, for the first, not the first time, but m one of the first times, I was in before the film started, I was off script. And I thought, to dot around the yeah. early cut, okay, I, and I was also you. trying to make a template, because I'm not a template man, I know you, we go through stages, I'm becoming yeah. one again, I'm, I hated it. So, to build my template, I got all the reels, like we do over on there on Pro Tools, we get the whole thing, reel one, reel two, reel three, reel four, five, and then I just had one big pro logic session, moved around so I could build my um, template for the movie in one go. And then what the idea was is to then chop that into five. Normally, it would be, before the, the silicon, it would be chop it into important cues. And I thought, and there's no chance, that I can get much better than that. You can definitely do a reel, without a doubt, on a new Mac. A, a whole reel. So reel one, so there's just five 
The final film was just five projects, real one to real five. The demo was one project, and Logic would not have it. There's no, it just wouldn't. It was crashing, um, and I was reading, and I also had track management problems on f across the five reels. I had nearly 2,000 tracks. I couldn't find anything. I was trying to use the hide track function in Logic with the H button. That crashes. So I'd been reading about Cubase, and I used to use Cubase 25 years ago. I thought I'd try it, and I didn't really like the look of it, and you know, it was really hard to learn, but it didn't crash, and it could handle any number of tracks. And I was thinking, man, and you can write your own scripts for track management. And if you want to find a track, you, you, know, you type a name in. I could type a name in here, so I could type in piano. And there's my pianos. Right. And if I click on that, it's going to bring up the pianos on the screen. They're, that's the pianos, the highlighted pianos. But it can go further than that. It can go much further. You can say to, I don't know, well it's got a thousand tracks here. You can say to Cubase, if you program it yourself, show me the synthesizers that are used in this project. And there they are. The synths we were just playing, you can say, I want to play with my analog synths. Okay, so that is external synths in this studio. Just the externals. Your new company, let's say we want to look at, that's everything that's Crow Hill in this project and I've not clicked the mouse yet. The problem I'd have is the EXS24. I love ESX24. So my main sampler well, for sampling is now Hallion. So what do we want to record? Let's say this Moog. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So what you do, you go into Hallion, find the Moog. So it's called a Moog CP1, CP1. Yeah, there you go. So that is now going in Hold on, this A, this D. Do a random one. Mapping? No, I don't have to do the mapping, it's done. Whoa! Okay, mapping's done. Um, I haven't clicked yet. Here's the sound. That's the sample. That's the real one. <laughs> so. That's, that's just made the sample for me, direct inside Cubase. It sits there in my external synth folder. So if I come up with a mad noise, just samples it. And then we'll move it to the other screen so we're not clicking our next, right? So you can resize it. You've got a big screen, you can resize it. This thing's a game changer. It's a fucking game changer. Amazing, absolutely amazing. That's my ESX24. It's a learning curve, but I found it to be, cre this, this has made me creative again. Yeah, I can see that. I can Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. I'm not going, you could say it's I want to. It's about flow, isn't it? Yeah, you could say I want to play the expander, right? Or oh, if I could spell, but you could say expander. And there's. How would you find the expander in 900 tracks? And you haven't called it, you know, you said exactly. Yeah, and it adds up. Yeah, yeah, and, that was, it's, and it's a mess. Andy, thanks so much for your time, man. It's, it's so been a pleasure. lovely to see you. Should we hit the pub? I think we should hit the pub, mate. <laughs> nice Brilliant, one. Christian. Nice one. And yes. Before you put in the many questions I'm sure you have for Andy in the video comments down below, he is running that entire system from an M2 MacBook Pro. So as I said, questions, leave them in the comments down below and we'll do our best to answer them. Please do subscribe if you haven't done already. As I mentioned before, we're a small startup and it really does help a company of our size. And if you want to support us further and get your hands on some handsome swag, do check out our new merch store. One of those always much appreciated and ding that bell if you want to be notified the next time we put a video up. Lots of love, see you next time.